Hi everyone. Good morning. Thanks for taking the time to be here in this webinar. As you may have been witnessing, enterprises today are going through digital transformation. Some of them go through on a large scale and others on a small scale. Regardless of that, digitalization has put across enterprises in a situation where there are multiple applications that are being rapidly built on a continuous basis, which has to be managed and delivered. So every CA's nightmare is to manage these applications in a way that will facilitate the rapid growth and development of the enterprise. So that's going to be our today's topic of the day. A quick word about Aspire. Aspire is a, a global technology services firm. Um, the headquarters uh, based out of US, UK, Singapore, Benelux, Middle East, and India. And Aspire has a specific focus on software engineering and have been working with uh, several of the enterprises and across different domains, including retail, BFSI, and education, and as part of the digital transformation efforts. A quick uh, overview on the speakers for today. I am Janaki, Janaki Jayachandran. Um, I am a regular speaker in uh, many of the events around, and uh, I work as a technology director here uh, towards uh, building the uh, digital platforms and frameworks that enable enterprises towards their digital transformation. We also have another speaker today, Jyoti Rengarajan. She, she is the chief technical architect and has been uh, uh, a key person in designing and constructing the Applaud framework, which is one of the digital management, application management framework. So we have her today to share some of her uh, insights on the platform and the capabilities that it can bring in to enterprises. A few housekeeping instructions before we get started. Uh, all phones are set to mute. If you have any questions, you can use the chat window or the questions window to post your questions. Uh, we'll take up the Q&A session towards the end of the uh, webinar, and uh, if we are not able to answer, we'll ensure you get a response over email. So with that, let's get started. So as I was mentioning, the digital transformation uh, within enterprises, um, there are certain key elements that are being focused uh, in order to facilitate the transformation. So one is from an evaluation perspective, uh, enterprises are looking forward to ways that will help them streamline the, the whole workflow of how the, the uh, business process happens, and also find opportunities to automate as much as they can, which is one of the key goals or principles of digital transformation. On the other hand, uh, there is a need for experimentation in today's uh, business environment uh, because it's not about failing but failing fast so that you learn and then you try to address uh, the learning and come out successful. So the environment and the digital transformation uh, has to facilitate this kind of an experimentation mode uh, within the enterprises. And also we have a, a, a mechanism through which they will be able to connect with the customers and also uh, some of the enterprises today are looking out ways to um, create revenue streams from the digital assets that they have currently in place. And this uh, revenue stream could be coming from customers or other vendors that work with enterprises, but that's definitely an area that is being explored now by enterprises. And finally, the alignment of it. So there is a need for continuously aligning these solutions uh, based on the business outcome, which is going to be changing over a period of time. So there has to be a, a mechanism to which will allow them uh, do this alignment on a continual basis. So these are the key elements uh, that are required for digital transformation to happen in an enterprise. So as part of that, uh, there is a need uh, for uh, enterprises to develop these custom applications. So what kind of uh, reasons or uh, use cases behind these custom applications? Of course, you have the, the out-of-box applications, which probably are going to be your, your huge ERP systems, the SAP systems, uh, and things of that nature. But then there is always a, a segment of uh, applications 
uh, which are probably custom built for enterprises. So some of the uh, scenarios that uh, lead to developing these custom applications, one is the unique requirements of the application itself. It's something that's not a, a common problem statement uh, for which there is a, an out-of-box product available. Rather, it's a very unique problem that the enterprise goes through, and hence you need a very custom solution that will address that particular business problem. Uh, the other reason could be to automate and reduce the manual efforts. So anything that is done manually today, the idea is to automate and uh, try to save those manual efforts, particularly if the task is a repeated one. The other reason could be the workflow itself, uh, trying to facilitate a business process as part of a workflow. So this could be uh, an action or a transaction that happens within the enterprise, or it even could be a communication between departments within the enterprise or across the geography, uh, which would also help in terms of improving the productivity of the overall operations. The other uh, strong use case is uh, consolidating these multiple data sources. So when different applications and systems generate these data, uh, you need a mechanism to unite these data. Uh, there are uh, integration tools available in the market, but again, in certain cases, either due to cost uh, reasons or probably the nature of the integration, enterprises end up building applications that does this job of bringing and consolidating the data across different uh, data sources. And there are certain applications which are customer facing, which is a, a, a very important set of applications because they uh, are being accessed by the end customers and hence uh, the, the degree of quality of those applications has to be on the higher end. And of course, factors like availability, usability, all of that becomes much more a critical factor. So this, this is something that customers use to interact or collaborate with the enterprise as part of their business transaction. And there are applications which are purely used for internal purposes and uh, cases where you probably need a certain set of data against which you can make decisions, business decisions. These could be around your analytics related applications and so on. So there are plenty of reasons as you could see why, why enterprises go for building these custom applications. And what happens in an enterprise scenario is, um, particularly with large enterprises, they quickly end up with uh, 50 to 100 applications in no time because the scenarios we are talking about here exist across departments, across the geographies of the enterprise, and hence each department tries to uh, build these applications to solve their own problems, and hence they end up quickly with a whole load of applications. And that's where the problem starts for the enterprises. Now that you have all those applications, uh, custom applications, now what are the challenges in managing them? Right? So the, the challenges could be divided into two segments. It could be a technical set of challenges or it could be management related challenges. So some of the technical challenges we look at, uh, many of these applications are being built by different teams, right? So which means uh, different teams take different approach towards building the application. It starts right from the technology stack to the architecture to the design they follow to the components they use, the plumbing layers they use. So you, if you look at the applications in an enterprise, they are kind of across technology, right? And there is no standard in place in terms of uni unification or unity among the applications, which is a big headache from a, a technology maintenance standpoint. So IT, if you look at, has to support a wide range of uh, technology stack and, and they don't know which application is going to be on which technology which is part of the nightmare itself. The, uh, the other key challenge is around the authentication and authorization, which happens to be a, a, one of the core problems that enterprises go through today. Now that you have uh, 1,500 applications, uh, each application cannot have uh, different types of authentication and authorization, right, which, which happens to be the case today. So tomorrow if the, the enterprises decides to have a policy around how the authentication has to be done or the authorization in terms of who can access which application or which features. Now, there is absolutely no clue as to where things are in one single place, right? So the IT team kind of scrambles over, tries to pull the information from an Excel file, from emails, from Word documents. They try to find this information across in 
just sits across in different sources, which is another big challenge for technology management. <clears throat> and also we talked about exposing some of these applications to customers. Right? So you may want to expose these applications maybe on a ad hoc basis to some of your customers. Again, uh, which customers? Again, depends on the service that they have taken from the enterprise. So you don't want to expose this to everyone. At the same time, you may want to expose to different customers at different degrees of the application itself. So for customer A, you may want to expose application 1 and 2. For customer B, it could be application 3 and 4. And it could go to the level of the features within the application as well. The last one is the time to market. Of course, there is a, a continuous pressure on the IT uh, towards uh, being able to produce these applications faster and being able to hit the uh, production uh, at a faster pace. That way, uh, business is able to make use of it. So there is a constant pressure towards uh, rapidly building these applications. So those are the uh, technical side of it. And uh, from a management point of view, of course, there is this huge count of uh, non-standardized custom applications, which has to be uh, kind of maintained from a complaints perspective, right, from a standards perspective. So that's the overall management part of it is going to be a, a headache. Uh, similarly, administration, when it comes to uh, the application administration itself, now there is the application-specific uh, functionality administration, which is fine to be within the each application, but then when you want to do something at across all the applications, for example, like we talked about changing the authentication itself, now you cannot run or get into 50 different applications and try to change it 50 times and test it 50 times. That's just not practically possible and it's going to take a huge amount of time and effort and budget. So the entire administration is today fragmented and sits across different applications. And it's not a single pane control that uh, they have today. The other uh, big scenario, uh, the very important scenario is enterprises uh, that have uh, offices across the geography, across the globe. What happens is they operate at uh, uh, what we call a multi-org unit level, right? So the whole enterprise is kind of segmented into different groups. So you may have a U.S. enterprise and then within U.S. you may have um, uh, east, U.S. East, and U.S. West. Similarly, for U.K., you may have another set of uh, offices. Now, each of these branches operate uh, at a certain uh, individual level, So, which means uh, some of the operations you, you may want to do, some of the provisions you may want to do, the control and uh, the chargeback. So those kind of things happen at the org unit level, right? So which means the applications should be able to be handled at an org unit level and you should be able to administer and manage them within that. And on the management front, as a last option, is the uh, keeping up pace with the business agility. As we know today, business uh, requires that agility and that's the whole reason behind the agile and lean development picking up uh, so much of pace uh, within the industry. But uh, from overall managing it, and being able to deliver these applications faster is going to be a challenge. So from a CIO perspective, if you look at CIO is responsible for both the technical and the management related aspects, which makes the CIO's job even more tougher. And hence, uh, and hence he's in a position to uh, find a solution for this. So given these are challenges now, uh, why does IT not able to solve it? Now, where do they fail, right? So interestingly, if you look at uh, a, a recent survey from CMO.com, um, many of the respondents have stated that uh, their internal IT systems to be the third biggest obstacle for them in achieving the digital transformation. So which is uh, a bit surprising because uh, IT on the other hand are, are supposed to be the, the enabler, the facilitator, but in this case they happen to be the bottleneck. So, if you look at some of the reasons behind uh, why they are bot being the bottleneck, so one is the lack of vision itself. Many a times IT operates uh, with a very, sh very short level of information that they get as vision, right? So they are more into the day-to-day -day, uh, related uh, work and, and they don't get the complete picture in many instances. 
The other aspect is the information itself being spread across in different places. So when you want to do something uh, at, at a global level, right, uh, in the example we talked about earlier, so there is a U.S. team, there is a U.K. team, there is an Asia team, and these teams have to talk together and they have to come to a common conclusion. So anything that you want to uh, apply at a global level can take really ages and ages because there is so much of work involved, so much of collaboration involved. Right? So there is no centralized information available. And there is a continuous technology evolution that is happening, which, which also puts uh, IT in the back step. So they are always in a catch-up mode uh, in terms of uh, maintaining these technologies. The distributed organization, which is spread across different uh, org units, departments, geographies, that complicates the whole level of information. And also the limitation with respect to infrastructure availability uh, also adds uh, complications to the IT and how they can uh, help out. So given these bottleneck, uh, what could be the, the solution for this scenario that we are talking about, right? So when we talk about the solution, um, what all the solutions should comprise of, uh, what should be the focus areas of the solution? So when we encountered uh, similar uh, issues with for some of our customers, so this is how our thought process was. So we divided the whole solution into four different areas addressing the challenges we talked about. Right. So the first area is the accelerator itself. Uh, accelerator which could help, uh, which is completely aimed towards developers, which could help them develop the application faster and uh, help them do it in a consistent fashion as well. So one of the problems we talked about is the time to market and the business agility. So this will help uh, the IT teams to uh, react in a much more faster manner, but also provide uh, the flexibility that they would require while developing these applications. So we'll talk about it in more detail as we go along. The second portion is the, the governance part of it. Right? So this is where uh, you get the administrative capabilities at an overall enterprise level which could help you in terms of managing these different applications, uh, ensuring uh, they are being provisioned correctly and uh, the right persons are using it, check the usage of the applications itself, uh, review the performance of them. Right? So it can provide you a lot of uh, intelligent insights uh, which will help you on a day-to-day -day decision making as well as for strategic decision making. The third piece uh, involves around the monetization part of it. Um, so like I was mentioning, there are uh, a good number of enterprises today uh, exploring ways to convert the digital assets to uh, a revenue stream. So in order to facilitate that, now let's say that the enterprise has a nice application which solves a particular business problem, and the enterprise thinks that this is something that many other companies would go through. So the natural progression is to take this application and productize it so that they could create a revenue stream out of it. So when you do this, the uh, mechanism to take this product, offer it as a subscription, have people subscribe to it, and then being able to associate a pricing to that particular uh, product, being able to charge the customer, get the payment. So there is a lot of uh, business steps that comes along as part of the monetization effort. So having the digital asset uh, is one part of the story, but then how do you really make money out of it is altogether a different set of problem, right? So the monetization aspect completely gives all the business um, features uh, which will help in taking any of your existing digital assets and convert them into a revenue stream by offering that as a subscription-based service to existing or uh, new customers. The last piece is the security, which is uh, a bigger piece by itself and which is a very important piece. So the security-related aspects are completely packaged and made available under one single um, framework. So all the applications comply to the security uh, norms and guidelines described by this particular component. So this way, you will get a single point control and you will be able to be sure how the whole security system works not just at uh, the framework level, but also at each of the application's uh, behavior as well. So let's get into each of these areas and uh, try to understand in greater depth uh, what does comprise in each of these uh, components within the solution focus areas. 
To start with, let's look at the, the accelerator itself. So uh, this is an example of an accelerator framework that uh, we have developed um, as, as part of our uh, solution. So there are two things we focused on. Uh, one is the application development uh, capability and the other one is the API uh, development capability because these are the two common things that are constantly being built today. Now applications of course are straightforward. Now API on the other hand uh, uh, is, is developed for multiple reasons. One is to support microservice architecture. Uh, today, a lot of enterprises are moving towards uh, a microservices-based architecture. So uh, all your services are created as APIs and you expose those APIs, uh, which are further consumed by the internal teams as well as external uh, customers towards building the solutions. So once you have the APIs available, uh, you could either have the applications built on top of it or you could even build uh, mobile solutions or mobile apps using the same API. So the API gives you the, the strong base on top of which you could build uh, multi-channel deliveries. So that's on the API front. And similarly, application front, of course, has the standard set of uh, functionalities. So if you look at uh, from an application standpoint, uh, some of the important things we had were uh, code generation capability. Right? So many of the standard plumbing code uh, required uh, are automatically generated uh, for the developer, so they don't have to spend time in, in developing those things. Similarly, uh, many transactional screens, if you look at, are either uh, individual screens or they uh, form a master uh, child kind of a scenario. Right? So you have a master record and then you have a, a set of child records beneath that. So there is an automatic uh, uh, screen rendering that is built uh, as part of the accelerator. So again, developers for these use cases need not do any additional coding, rather they could simply use uh, these reusable components. And one of that is also the, the forms and grids. So each page, many of the transaction page either has a form or a grid for displaying the data. So again, that is available to the developers. And then the rest of uh, the set of REST helpers which could help uh, in making these calls, the API calls back. So those are some of the things available on the application front. On the API front, uh, the API is exposed uh, a set of default crude services, so anything to deal with creation, reading, updating, deleting are readily available and it comes with the microservices support, so it's easier for the developers to follow the microservice architecture. And there is a set of item templates and code generator that comes for the APIs as well. And there is an inbuilt Swagger integration, so documentation, generating the documentation uh, becomes much more easier. And more importantly, many of these things, if you look at, uh, these things start to build the standardization of how developers approach the development of functionality. So if you look at, uh, after setting up all these things, the core focus of developers is going to be just on the business functionality. They are not going to be thinking on anything else because they know exactly how each of these things are going to work. So all they need to do is just uh, think about the uh, requirement of the business functionality and just code for it. Okay. And the API also comes with the OAuth 2.0 authentication factor. Now this is at, at one layer, right, which is the, the application on the API layers. But then uh, many of these applications, like we, we saw earlier, uh, require a non-functional uh, requirement support as well. So many times this is an area that developers tend to miss um, because it's also the fact that uh, none of the business explicitly uh, says it or states it clearly in black and white. So many times this goes uh, under the hood and um, it kind of boils out only at us when people tend to go to production, right? So what we have done uh, is also consider the non-functional requirements as part of the accelerator framework. So any application that you develop is by default going to support all these non-functional requirements and it's up to the, uh, the developer to, uh, uh, to consume which of these non-functional requirements is, is, is essential for a given application. Right? So what you see in the bottom of the uh, slide is the important NFRs, uh, 8 NFRs, which deals with the configurability. Uh, configurability is where you train to uh, have the application be uh, configurable and, and customizable but without additional coding, right? So you try to 
provide or bring in as many combinations of configuration already built in. And uh, using that, you will be able to accomplish a lot of things when uh, the requirements or the functionality changes from uh, one scenario to another scenario. So one of the important examples here could be the, the custom fields, right? So let's take an example of an application used by uh, US geography and the same application being used by uh, UK geography. Now, some of the additional fields might be required uh, to capture uh, geographic specific information, right? So in these instances, uh, having this capability will enable uh, the applications to be uh, on the fly, you can add these additional fields using the, the governance portal, uh, which can be done even by the IT admin. So they don't even have to approach the developers. So the IT admin will have provisions to go and add additional fields to these applications and they can do it by org unit level, right? So which means if, if UK wants one additional field to be captured as part of, let's say, their employee information, IT admin can make it happen without a line of code and they can make it happen only for UK geography. So that's where the power of this whole platform comes into picture. So similarly, things like performance, maintainability, scalability are factors. These are basically some of the guidelines that are already taken into consideration while uh, building the layers underneath these accelerators. So they are all, all designed and, and written for unlimited scalability. So that tomorrow when the application has to scale out to multiple servers, uh, you could do it on the fly with today's cloud uh, auto-scaling kind of features. So there is no additional coding or tweaking required. It's by default enabled for applications. Similarly, on the security front, uh, application level security, things like single sign-on and uh, policy-based administration, these are out-of-box uh, functionality coming from the non-functional requirement. So if, uh, for example, an application has to uh, interact with the, uh, let's say, end customers or consumers, and you want to open up uh, a social-based authentication, right? So there is an inbuilt support for this, uh, with, which could authenticate with any uh, social uh, logins, including Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, right? So which means the developer just doesn't have to worry about it. So it's already available, right? So the complete challenge of getting the whole authentication, including things like multi-factor authentication. So if you want to have a, a multi-factor authentication with the SMS-enabled code, all of that is readily available for them. So multi-tenancy is another big, uh, very complex architectural uh, uh, design. Uh, like we talked about cases where uh, customer-facing applications are being developed, uh, the application should have the capability to operate in a multi-tenant mode so that uh, the same application can be served to different customers, but then the application maintains the integrity by following the multi-tenant architecture. So when customer A requests for information, the same hosted application works in the context of uh, tenant A or customer A and delivers the data for them, whereas when next customer B comes in, the whole thing changes according to customer B. So this is an architecture uh, design principle that has to be laid in the fundamental of the architecture itself. So it's already done in this particular case. Similarly, things like the vulnerability checks and uh, uh, the uh, security related OS threats and things like that are already validated in this particular framework. So this is what we uh, constituted as uh, the accelerator framework, a very powerful framework that could cut down a lot of time that developers tend to spend otherwise. So these are some of the key features that uh, I just described about. So in the interest of time, I'm just keeping this slide. Now, so one of the other uh, uh, questions that we very often come across is, um, so what, why not use a visual development tool? Uh, and some people refer to that as uh, RAP tools, right? Rapid application development tools. Uh, now, <clears throat> of course, they bring in a, a set of advantage to the table, but then they also bring in a set of challenges. So it's very important to weigh the pros over the cons before somebody actually makes the decision, right? So if you look at a, a visual development tool, so many times they come with a, a set of uh, a, a tag limitations, right? They come with a set of uh, restrictions 
for example, that you, you need to use a proprietary technology of that particular vendor, or it has to be hosted only within the cloud uh, provided by that particular vendor. Right? So things like this create what we call the vendor lock-in. And uh, in today's uh, business environment, you really don't want yourself to get locked in with one particular vendor and have them dictate you. So rather you would want that flexibility at your end to decide at the merit of the problem being handled. So vendor locking is one major challenge in this uh, scenario. And there is also the learning curve that comes with it because some of these have their own proprietary language, some of them have their own way of developing it. So apart from your team learning .NET, they will have to learn something additional uh, which is going to be very specific only for this case. Right? So which also puts you in, the, in a situation of skilled resources availability. So you may not find resources uh, as easily as you could find a .NET resource or a Java resource. Rather, you will have to maybe get some resource and then train them on this technology before you could actually use them for your work. And one of the biggest challenges uh, that we have seen customers traveling in this route and, and returning back uh, is the limited customization options they get. Many of these uh, visualization tools uh, provide you templatized way of achieving a functionality because that's the way you could do things faster. So when you want to do even a very small change which deviates from the templatized way of doing it, then you don't have an option, right? For example, if you want to change uh, the UI layout to a, a different model or let's say you want to use a particular third party control, now, many of these visualization tools don't allow that. So they come with a standard set of controls, a standard set of layouts, and probably they will give you three options, and you have to pick one of them. So there is no uh, luxury there for you to uh, dictate or make your call uh, as to how you would like the overall output to be. Right. So these are some of the typical challenges involved uh, with uh, a visual development tool. So that was the reason why uh, we created this accelerator approach uh, because what we felt uh, the accelerator approach is, is somewhere in between, right? It's neither a ground up development where you do everything by hand, neither it is not something that is templatized and you can just do it in one or two ways. Rather, we wanted to be somewhere in between by giving them um, the best of both the worlds. So, one of the key advantages of this accelerator is uh, the speed with control. Uh, very importantly, we wanted the, the architecture flexibility and, and decision making to be with the architect itself, right? So it should not be with the vendor. So in this case, uh, the architect has all the rights and they can make decisions on which components of the framework to use. Like for example, we talked about four different components, right? So we talked about accelerator, we talked about governance, security. So let's say, for example, you want to use a completely a different security engine for your application. You should be able to do that, right? So it's not like you either take everything in one shot or you don't take anything. So we wanted to give that flexibility back to uh, the architects so that they are able to make these decisions. So some of, the, some of the advantages are mainly lying around that, and also it's completely cloud neutral, so you could build it and deploy it in whichever location you would like to put it. Yeah, so this is the one I was referring about as a plug and play development effort. So it's, it's about selective integration. So out of all the modules uh, that are available, you should be able to decide and select which ones you would like to use and which one you may probably want to have other options uh, that are available. And once you have developed it, you should be able to deploy it anywhere. Again, the choice of deployment is very important because um, so today you may want to probably have it in AWS. Tomorrow you may want to move it to Azure for various business reasons. You should be able to do that. There should not be any restrictions coming from that perspective. So moving on to the, uh, the governance piece of it. So the governance is, is all about how you manage all these applications. How do you have control of these applications at a, a holistic level? So there are a set of capabilities we built uh, towards uh, managing it. For example, the service catalog is where all the applications that are available in the enterprise can be viewed and, and managed and operated in, in one single place, right? And if you want to add a new application tomorrow, you can provision that 
through this governance portal, and then you can decide who gets access to this application, right? So it, if it is just going to be only US or US and UK, or rather within US only a certain department is going to use, or even going further down, within the department only a particular role can have access to this application. So it goes to that level of a granularity where you will be able to control it, and all of this from one single portal, the governance portal. And it also gives you capabilities around uh, how the whole uh, service uh, is organized. So you can keep the services in a hierarchical fashion. You can organize it by modules, features, right? And there is also an interesting feature to manage the data. Uh, because the data partition plays a very important role to support the compliance factors as well. So when you operate, for example, uh, beyond the geographic boundaries, you may want to retain the data in the respective boundaries. So data partition becomes a, a key aspect. Similarly, in cases where it's exposed to customers, you may sometimes want to have the data isolated by customer uh, because you may deal with some critical information uh, dealing with the customer. So you may prefer keeping the data separate. So the provision for data partition and managing the whole uh, the partition sets uh, is another important feature we have on the governance front. On the security front, uh, like I said, we have uh, a complete uh, customer, vendor, and employee identity management. Now, it's important to realize that each of these are different stakeholders with different privilege rights within the system, right? A customer using uh, your system or application is different from an employee using your, the same application. So there is an inherent uh, need to identify and segregate these different uh, roles. So we have that uh, segregation already done and available. And like I said, we have a complete SSO and federation support to connect with any authentication um, source. And the complete user activities are monitored, uh, audited, available at any point in time. So you'll be able to easily find out in one single place uh, what has happened for a particular user uh, or what uh, kind of actions have they done. Similarly, all the application uh, audit information is available in one place. So you don't have to scramble around in 10 different places, 10 different logs, trying to find out. Uh, it's all available in, in the same single location. And the security also gives uh, a very grand role privilege management. Like I said, you'll be able to operate at a very grand level. Um, we'll show you some of the uh, examples as we walk through some of the use cases as well. The last part is the monetization part. Uh, so this could be used in multiple ways. Uh, the one we talked about is with the customer having this uh, as a subscription-based service and being able to charge the customer on a recurring model. Could be monthly, quarterly, uh, or yearly. The other use case is also about uh, internal charge tags, right? So sometimes some of these applications are exposed to other parts of the enterprises, could be other geographies. And then you may want to internally do a chargeback, right? It's not literally uh, a similar model where you raise an invoice to a customer, but then you want to keep track of what is the usage of these applications by the various entities within the enterprise. So we have that facility as well. And the complete uh, uh, payment support, uh, credit card, uh, automatic invoice and, and payments are all taken care of within the monetization. So with that, I will hand it over to Jyoti to walk you through some of the classic enterprise use cases and how uh, we have kind of solved it using uh, the approach that we discussed just now. Over to you, Jyoti. Thanks, Janaki. Good morning, all. I'm going to show you a quick glimpse of a platform upload today. I'll be covering at a high level how upload solves the key aspects of what we just discussed which are unified security, unified governance, and accelerator. Upload contains a governance and administration portal, which has the capability to manage and take a unified view of different applications from a single panel view. The key users of this portal are admins, whose responsibility is to manage the application and the management team who wants to measure the key performance indicators of these applications and have an umbrella view. And currently in the super admin view, the boxes 
you see here are the applications that are provisioned in the system. As a super administrator, I have the access to all the apps in the organization. Please note that this portal can also be used to administer application across our units. Admins will be able to seamlessly register an application via the UI. Um, and then once an application is registered, the entire security management and the governance of it can happen directly from the portal. Let's look at some of the identity and access management features in Upload. This is a list of different features available in IAM. So to begin with, role management feature allows an admin to add a role dynamically to an application. And once a role is provisioned, we'll also be able to set the rights and permissions to the role. So the screen that you are seeing is where a role is added, and you can see that the role is added specific to an application. And this is this can be done dynamically by the administrator without going back to the IT team. This is where the rights are added to the roles. Rights can even be controlled at a granular entity and role level. You can see the view here where a particular role is given a privilege at an entity and it can even get to a role level. An admin would also be able to define the access rules and policies that need to be attached to the application at an API level or action level or even a UI element level. The access policy we are currently seeing are the rights a user should have to access an API. Admin can also configure single sign-on right from the portal, uh, and it could even be social logins, or based authentication, etc. Now, this use case is very useful if you are dealing with vendors or suppliers or customers, and they can use their organization credentials to log in seamlessly. Please also note that all these security features in Upload are available in a API form as well, and you can use it in the application by simply integrating with the APIs. So far, we are in the admin panel. Let me also show you a view of a sample app application called Project Management that's built and integrated with the upload via APIs. I would like to spend a few minutes on this authentication view before I get into the Project Management view, which is a sample application and explain the different features that is available to you out of the box. You can see that I have the ability to reset the password, which is a part of the self-service capability that Upload offers. You can observe that it has the features to log in via all the social uh, logins like Facebook, LinkedIn, etc. And they can also log in by clicking the My Company ID using their organization credentials and it can do a single sign-on with, the with their company's uh, authentication provider. These features, again, to stress, are mandatory if you're dealing with customers and vendors. Upload has also the ability to turn on multi-factor authentication. If MSA is turned on, any OTP is needed after login, and you can use this only for certain types of roles and you can get to the level of users to enable it. Now this is a view of a project management which is a sample application which is built on top of the accelerator and integrated with Upload using APIs. Now let's say you can see that there are four menus here which are project, my task, customer and admin. Let's say that in an organization, suddenly there is a business decision that project managers cannot add customers, but there is another role which is brought in to do that. Now, let me also show you how you can change this behavior without touching the code. 
admin can go to the admin console, take away the privilege for customer management, and it is reflected in your application directly. The product admin can completely manage this by himself without having to get to the IT for such needs. Let's next also see some governance related features. Right from the central portal, an admin can control various aspects of the application without getting to the IT team. Various actions that an admin can perform are configuring email and SMS notification for the application, audit notifications that are sent from the application, audit events of the applications, view stats on usage of the system, configure workflow using a workflow designer and dashboard. So I'd also like to take you to a use case where we would want to add a dynamic field to a form that is already developed and deployed. Let's say once the project management has gone live, now there is a requirement to add a field called project extension demo, right? Now, instead of getting to the developers and waiting for it to get developed and released, admin can directly get into the entity configuration view of upload and add this field directly. And you can see that it's also been integrated with the uh, application via APIs and it immediately is reflected, right? This completely gives the control on security and certain level of configuration, audit, et cetera, to the administrator and also provides the stats to the management team right from a central view. Now let's get to the next part of uh, building a new application using the accelerator that we talked about. Upload offers a base code structure and plumbing on top of which you add the code and functionality. It is by default integrated with all the features of Upload that we just saw via API and hence comes inbuilt with security and configurability and other aspects. It's also integrated with IDE as you can see here and let you create a microservice based API and a single page application screen using Angular in lesser than 10 minutes with help of inbuilt code generators. The creative code follows the best possible architecture which is secure, configurable and also auditable. The view that you're seeing is where minimally a, a developer has to configure the base fields and once they do that, they get the screen um, which we can show, which you can see here, which is a transactional form and a transactional grid. And we also support multiple kinds of uh, uh, templates on the screen. So that's it from me today. Over to you, Janaki. Thank you, Jyoti. So just to summarize, uh, the benefits that we uh, have been uh, discussing all along. So one is the application standardization. So it definitely is no more in the hands of the uh, developers to make some of the critical decisions. Rather, IT can uh, have that uh, carved in stone and ensure that any application that is being developed follows these standards without fail. And with also the governance portal uh, reduces a lot of workload for the IT because many of these are now uh, automated and uh, could be easily accomplished through these administration portals and uh, that's a lot of savings from an IT uh, perspective. And uh, the whole thing is to enable the business agility, being able to respond faster, being able to develop solutions quicker, and be able to uh, accommodate the changes, business changes that are coming up using the governance features. So overall, the accelerator is aimed towards increased product, uh, productivity of the developers itself, and uh, they can simply focus, have their focus on the business functionality, business problem, rather than worrying about all the ancillary areas. 
Uh, then it's a very easy way of monetizing your existing digital assets. So, so the monetization part of it uh, brings in those capabilities. And as you could see, the entire administration can be done under a single pane view. So you have the complete purview of your enterprise in a single screen, and uh, from there you could easily build down. And this whole solution is much more cost effective uh, compared to some of the uh, the other tools in the market, which, which again, there are multiple tools for each of these things, but then you don't get it together as a unified solution. So the whole idea is to centrally administer and, and globally deliver your results. So with that, uh, we come to uh, the question session of uh, our webinar. So please feel free to post your questions, and uh, we can take it up uh, and, and address some of them here in this session. We'll give a minute for the question to come by. So uh, there is one question that has come um, around uh, the support for cloud. Uh, probably Jyoti can answer this. Uh, so what cloud does the upload framework support is a question. Uh, upload, as uh, Janki mentioned, is cloud neutral. It can be hosted in Azure, Amazon, or even in an on-premise data center. Thank you, Jyoti. And the other question is, uh, how easy it is to integrate existing applications uh, into something like a platform like this? Because many of, many customers would already have this application built. So I think uh, this person would like to know what about the existing application. Um, as as uh, I just mentioned, if every feature that we saw as a part of Upload are also available in the form of APIs, and it's hence very easy to integrate. Having said that, the application itself could be a package application or a custom application. And obviously, if it's a custom application, it's going to be much more easier for somebody to integrate compared to a package application. OK. So the other question is around uh, the comparison we made between the accelerator versus the, uh, the visual development tools. So the question around is what kind of productivity difference uh, do we do you foresee between the two options? See, when I compare a low code with an accelerator driven, of course, the productivity factor alone of a low code is going to be high. But then, uh, as we also discussed, the overhead, the performance, what like the limitations it has, has to be weighed against a coded approach, right? And then it's sometimes very easy to miss the fact that developers are better in coding rather than a visual development. It takes probably five minutes for a, a developer to code a logic compared to coding that logic using a visual development mode. So having that factored in, I would say, Productivity is not that high compared to a accelerator given to a developer, but the things that we lose in a low-code platform is what we should be looking at. Sure, uh, Jyoti. And just to add to that, uh, like I mentioned, the, the key factor is uh, how important is it for the enterprises to retain that control? That is also something that has to be taken into consideration. Because, of course, if you're talking about a straight vanilla kind of an application, it just has some few screens, add more Dell screens, and that's all you are expecting, then, of course, the, the, the visual development tools probably are the best choice. But then in today's scenario, uh, with the kind of agility we are expecting, uh, we don't know how things are going to change tomorrow, so you may want that flexibility at your end to have that control and make these decisions even at a later point in time. So 
moving on to the next question, Juthi, how uh, quickly can one build an application using uh, the accelerator? That completely depends on the application itself, I must say. Uh, but I would say that it at least cuts down 30 to 40 percent from what we have seen. Uh, what we have kept it we have kept it simple for developers to adopt and what we have handled are what developers hate to do the most. Uh, if you look at, they don't like to, I mean, spend their time in uh, tasks that they don't have to think, right? Basically, that's the point. So they don't want to create just mundane tasks of screens or basic validations or basic CRUD-related operations or basic workflow kind of thing, right? They are there to solve a um, niche problem and that's what they like to do and that's what when you can boost their productivity as well. So that's exactly what the accelerator takes care of. Taking away the mundane task from them and also giving them a strong base to build on top of so that they can use their thinking skill and develop products better and faster. Thanks, Yuthi. And just to add on to what Yuthi mentioned, I would like to uh, take one of the case studies that uh, we have uh, done where uh, we have helped a customer undergo a digital transformation and as part of that a lot of uh, uh, services have to be created, a lot of applications have to be created. So uh, so the, having this kind of a platform helped us uh, do it in a very fast scale. So we are almost able to churn out um, every new application in like four weeks to six weeks time frame. That's a complete application end-to-end, -end, right from requirements to production. Um, so that's that's the kind of a, a benchmark uh, that we we are able to see uh, with an approach of using this accelerator. Uh, I think that's all the questions we have for today. So once again, thanks everyone for taking the time to be uh, here as part of this uh, webinar. and. Uh, uh, all of uh, all of the registrants and the attendees will receive a copy of this uh, slide text, so we'll share that with you. And uh, uh, look forward to see you in the next webinar. Have a great day. Bye.